Hello, I'm Tim Blair, CCIM Institute's 2021 Global President. Welcome to today's webinar, Commercial Real Estate Outlook, Reopening Paths to Success. We're happy to share this webinar with everyone in the industry today. For CCIM Institute members, this is just one of many member benefits that are designed to help you adapt and thrive in 2021 and beyond. Joining us today is CCIM Institute Chief Economist, KC Conway, CCIM. KC is going to share how commercial real estate opportunities may evolve as the country and the world begin the post-pandemic reopening in earnest. He'll also share insights on property sectors and regions to watch, along with the skills needed to successfully compete. In short, pay attention. This is great information we all need to hear. Please feel free to ask questions throughout using the Q&A tab. We'll be answering as many as we can at the end of the discussion. And if you're experiencing any technical difficulties, please use the chat feature to ask for help. This recording will also be available on CCIM Institute's YouTube channel by tomorrow. And now on to the main event. Please welcome our very own Chief Economist and Prognosticator Extraordinaire, Mr. K.C. Conway. K.C., to you, sir. Thank you, Tim. Great to be joining everybody. And um, so if, if Tim has not already explained in, in the South, when we finally hit 80 degree weather in, uh, in the spring, we, we no longer wear neckties. It's not just a, a COVID or Zoom thing. So thank you, Tim, for, for making sure we got that reminder. So. This one will be uh, interesting. It's a, it's a shorter deck. It's less than 20 slides. Um, Larry and Rich are still in, in a gas that I can produce a, a slide deck less than 20 slides, but uh, my partner Beverly's having a good influence on me. Um, but we want it to be conversational. We have a really neat setup at the end that, that Tim's going to guide us through. So let's just get going. So I thought a good place to start was, would be with my own report card and look at what I talked to you about back in January, January 28th. And as you know, um, big fan of the legacy Smith Family Diner in uh, Greensboro. And uh, their, their saying was they work eight days a week. Um, and I love that saying, because I think all of us in the commercial real estate industry are working eight days a week, or we're thinking eight days a week. And so I kind of laid out the eight things. The two I want to particularly reemphasize that I, that I emphasized back then was vaccination success. And I shared with you the Becker's hospital index um, on vaccination by state and who was doing well and not. And if you remember back in January, we had a logistics uh, cluster underway for the vaccination. And I said, you know, if we, if we can get past that and get it working right, things could, could really reopen and we go, well, if not, this could be a more difficult challenge into the into the second half of the year. So here we sit. We watched it. We were now we've gone from less than 50 percentage, 50 percent of the doses that would be given to the states being administered to now. You know, we've got um, almost 130 million Americans uh, vaccinated out of the one or two shots. Uh, so uh, very good success. And that's having a big impact on the economy. The other one was earnings. And I tell you, I think this is your best crystal ball forward. And believe it or not, um, in the second quarter, second and third quarter of last year, we had a decline of over 30% in corporate earnings. And in the in the fourth quarter of this year, we actually saw that rise to over 8%. It was up 8% year over year from December to December. And we just started this morning with just incredible uh, started the earnings with the bank earnings, the major investment banks. Goldman Sachs set a record, not only for them, but maybe all time. Uh, it was a $5 billion increase in one quarter in their earnings. So if you're in a New York or money center bank, you're doing quite well. Um, that's not going to be predictive of what happens with our regional banks. And remember the warning I said was watch the regional banks as they release the loan losses that they built up last year. That's what's helping. It's going to help big time our regional and smaller banks. I think that's premature. I think we have some things coming. The other thing I would tell you to watch in earnings this time is watch for the margin compression. So commodity prices are up. Inflation is there. I don't know why the Fed can't see inflation, but um, believe me, it is there. We'll talk about that. Um, so we're seeing companies, while they're beating on revenues, and I think they will continue to be in beating on earnings per share estimates, I think their margin um, compression uh, is going to be eaten up by inflation. And that's, that's going to be interesting to watch how it plays out. So 
I have a new theme every quarter. We work to have a new theme and visual. And so we're in the midst, we're in the, uh, we started four weeks ago, a whole house renovation. And believe it or not, tomorrow, one day shy of, of a month, we will have our final inspections. We did during COVID a complete house renovation <laughs> in four weeks. And I can tell you, I've learned more about economics during this renovation and supply chain and inflation um, than I probably could at any point in time. But during that, we had to pack up everything. And one of the things that um, my son found as we were packing up was a antique collection of kaleidoscopes and he had never seen one. And so I'm dating myself again, Tim. Uh, before video games, we had kaleidoscopes, and um, and we went to college. You know, maybe we 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 did uh, beverages with kaleidoscopes, and they had even more more visual <laughs> meaning. But I thought this would be visual a good visual for us because if you look at a kaleidoscope or looked at one, you have all the color beads, and they add different context to what's going on. And I think as we emerge from COVID in a post vaccination period, there's many more dimensions in 3D and the color of different beads that we're gonna see affect this economy. And that may be a good way to be thinking is what are the different gradations in that kaleidoscope that have different meanings. So we got one here for the economic and the other for commercial real estate. And we'll talk about those. So uh, you're getting the first view at the, at the Red Shoe Economics and CCIM kaleidoscope. All right, this one um, is if the world were flat, this is what the different plate tectonics would look like around the world where all the plates are moving. And so we, we thought with what's going on and all the different forces underneath and pulling us apart and shifting that maybe we would adapt um, you know, plate tectonics to economic tectonics. So this is what the world would look like when it's flat. When, um, when Beverly and I were talking about this, I said, you know what it looks like? It looks like one of those Rorschach ink blot tests that we all had to take at some point in our lives, whether it was for a job or admission to college. So I put an ink blot of a butterfly. So even all of these um, uh, tectonic plates look like an ink blot. So let's explore those. There are three primary types of plates that affect how they move. On the far left there um, on slide five is convergence. And this is where you have the forces both working beneath and then um, above as the plates scrape against each other. Those of you from California and the West Coast and uh, any of you that have traveled into the um, uh, Japanese and Asian Pacific region are very familiar with this as these plates move. And so I put a few of them, we're gonna talk about these. The Fed monetary policy, what's going on beneath the surface is having huge uplift and in, in issues with the economy and going to continue. They also lead to inflation. So there's a lot of forces affected it going on in inflation. So just give you a few examples. When the Fed says, you know, we just had CPI data and it's running maybe two and a half percent, I call barbecue sauce on that. So as you know, um, that's my polite way after being Tim 35 plus years in the South, for calling BS on something that's not exactly true. So barbecue sauce, um, food inflation, if you've been to the grocery store, even if you've looked at your online groceries coming to your house, is up somewhere between four and 6%. Automobile inflation, it's up 9%. The uh, different auto numbers were produced in the last week and auto prices are up year over year, 9%, even though we idled factories. And home prices we'll talk about are up 15% to a record median home price. So. I don't know where the Fed's looking, but whether it's a house or whether it's a car or whether it's energy or where it's food, everything in my life is up four to 20 plus percent. And if any of you are doing construction or working with a client, you're looking at some commodity prices like steel, over 100% increase. So divergence is when things are going in different directions. Um, so kind of think about the Rocky Mountains and think of what's moving west of the Continental Divide and east of the Continental Divide. And housing definitely fits in there. You have the affordable and the non-affordable. You have what's affecting workforce changing housing. You have multifamily and single family. The other one is state taxes. We have states going in different directions and some are continuing to keep high taxes and hoping that the SALT uh, limitations uh, from the Trump 2017 tax act will go away. But basically companies are more likely to move to a low cost state for business uh, to, despite whatever their voting laws are. Um, because they got to mitigate the coming higher corporate taxes. And retail, retail is also moving in a different, is also moving in a different uh, direction. All right, there goes the speaker, my wife called me from school. Uh, retail, so think of the order online, the e-commerce economy versus the, um, you know, the traditional shop um, and pick up type of economy. And I think in retail, we're gonna see a big change that nobody's expecting. 
So we've been consuming all this stuff at home, uh, groceries and you know home improvement like I'm doing. And I think as we open up and can travel again, our consumer spending is going to shift from home improvement, beauty and supply, you know, sporting goods, all that to let's go take a trip and leisure and travel and going out to eat is going to completely change the game. So I think that's a divergence that's happening. Hotel, leisure is going to come back very strong. When we can get out and we all get on planes and show our vaccination card, um, we're going to travel. The leisure is going to come back. I don't think the business travel is going to come back as quick. Uh, companies look at the earnings in the bank earnings in Wells Fargo under huge pressure to contain costs, to lower costs, to become more efficient. And I think they're going to use this virtual and virtual conferences as a way to keep uh, business travel down and under control. And then I think, um, you know, in the earnings side, we're going to see a huge bifurcation. So if the 10 year treasury continues to rise and the Fed loses control of inflation and that 10 year rises, it decimates uh, technology stocks. So why technology stocks? Uh, I was just looking before I got on today that 35% of all NASDAQ um, companies have no earnings, yet they're trading on expected or anticipated earnings of 15 times. So if you don't have earnings today and it's all to come in the future and rates are higher, go back to your discounted cash flow days, the higher the IRR, the lower the value. So this is why technology companies are gonna remain very volatile except for one group crypto. So you look at Coinbase going public today and the insane numbers. Uh, there are only 82 S&P 500 companies that have a market capitalization of 100 billion. Not even the NASDAQ and the New York Stock Exchange combined have a $100 billion valuation. Coinbase will probably, the first trade's going right now at 381, just looking over, 381. It will open as a greater than $100 billion company. Think of that and think about how dismissive we all were of cryptocurrency in the digital economy five, 10 years ago. The third one is lateral. What are those lateral movements? We were moving one way to the other. Remote work is one, how we do work. We're still gonna do work. We just may not all do it in person. And what does that mean for dense urban cities and suburban and secondary markets? The other one is commercial real estate credit metrics. Remember the last six months to three quarters, it's been hotel and retail that have just been devastated. And I think that's changing. And we're already seeing it from TREP data that the uh, delinquency numbers are coming down and they're coming down really rapidly on hotel and, and retail. So I think it's gonna rotate in the more distressed credit metrics are gonna be in office. And I think um, the dense urban city multifamily where rents got too out of control. And then the capital flows. So we're seeing new players like South Korea that are rivaling Canada for the capital flows in the United States. So I think if you think about your real estate, your local economy and the macro economy in these three dimensions, you know, what's beneath the surface, what's you know, kind of pulling apart and then what's moving sideways kind of rotationally shifting. Um, I think that might be a good way to think about the next six months to the end of the year. So let's start with the convergence. Um, my first one is the Federal Reserve. So many of you have seen Jay Powell was on 60 Minutes um, over the weekend, uh, said that he didn't think Bitcoin and cryptocurrency was a problem because as Americans, we like cash. I about fell out of my chair. This guy has no clue about digital currency and its transformative in impact. China is launching its own digital currency. And if you wanna do business with China, Within a year, you're probably gonna have to conduct that transaction within their own digital currency. This is a tantamount to kind of like an economic warfare, an economic competition. And as the United States, we're losing this battle right now. Um, on, the, on the Fed, um, inflation uh, is very real. I mentioned you know, food inflation, auto inflation, home inflation. And so the CPI came out and said, it's all tame. And they said, if you take out energy, if you take out food, if you take about all, all the things that we spend money on, no problem with inflation. <laughs> um, I think that's a very flawed way. I, I explained and criticized that when I was within the Fed and briefing Chairman Bernanke in 2005 to 10. But I want you to be aware of some other tools the Fed has that they will probably be deploying to keep to their script that they're not gonna raise interest rates until 2022 or maybe 2023. So the first one at the top of here, slide six, is the acronym AAL. That stands for the Allowance for Lease and Loan Losses. And so this is what banks have to hold back to plan for these losses. 
And the Fed has been telling the banks at the end of this year, hey, we didn't see any losses, go ahead and, re and release money. So on top of the fiscal stimulus, on top of the Fed's monetary stimulus of growing their balance sheet, we're also getting stimulus from the banks being told, get these reserves out of the bank and start lending. So we have this flood of capital from three directions coming into the economy, and this is what's fueling the inflation side. Another one that's gonna be really important to watch. This is how the Fed can pull the banks back without raising interest rates until they want to. It's called IOER, and it stands for Interest on Excess Reserves. So if the banks have all these reserves and the Fed wants them to hold on to them, it says, hey, we'll pay you more interest on those than you can make in the market. So they'll pay them two or 3%. If they don't want them to hold those reserves, which is right now they want it to get into the economy, they lower it to near zero. So there's no incentive for the bank to hold these reserves. They can't make any money by having the Fed hold on to those reserves. This is a very powerful tool that I think will come into play at the end of the year when the Fed wants the banks to pull back and bring these reserves back in. So I'm in the camp that inflation is out of the bottle. Um, and once it gets out of the bottle, those of us that have been around since the 1970s, <clears throat> go back to the Jimmy Carter era after um, uh, Ford and Nixon, it didn't take long. And many of you may remember the misery index, remember prime going to 21% with Paul Volcker. That all occurred within a three year period of time. So when people think this can't happen and it's a long time in the coming, you need to go back and study history a little bit. There's also a correlation and a warning here for what's occurring in Bitcoin. So I think it surpassed 64,000 a coin yesterday. It's on its way to 65 or 66,000 today. Bitcoin is a vote against the value of the dollar. So what the Fed is doing, remember, uh, we're a fiat currency, just like most uh, currencies around the world. And what that means is there's nothing ba backing the value of our currency. And so when you just print money in the way the Fed grows its balance sheet, remember, it doesn't manufacture anything and it doesn't sell anything. So if you don't make something and sell anything, how do you grow your balance sheet? They call treasury and say, print money. It's very inflationary. We've grown the money supply by over 20% in the last six months. We're devaluing the dollar. And so Bitcoin, they're not making more Bitcoin. So its supply is static and the demand goes up. So Bitcoin goes up. And if you're a corporate entity and you wanna stabilize your currency exchange with different countries, Put, it, put your cash into Bitcoin. And now it's an, a kind of an algorithm that means no matter what the Fed does or the European Central Bank does, this digital currency won't go down in value. And so if your trading partners, the price of what you're buying or selling doesn't get affected. Here's another neat trick. That Bitcoin is considered Forex, foreign exchange, it's currency. And there's debate whether it's taxable. So what a neat trick if you're a company, if you had bought Bitcoin a few months ago at 30,000 a coin, it's now up to 60,000 and you're trading in that, you've got more buying power versus you've got less buying power in the dollar. The reason I bring this up is as, as CCIMs and brokers, we need to be planning on more commercial real estate transacted in Bitcoin. So this could undermine 1031 exchange. If I put my cash uh, into, um, into Bitcoin or Coinbase, and let it, let it ride up, what we might find is over the three to six month period while we're concluding that transaction, it went up 50 to 100% in value. And now maybe I don't even need debt on the deal. And guess what? It's not taxable. So there's huge tax loopholes that have to be addressed here in foreign exchange. If you wanna see how companies that are in your community or backyard are using this and how, money, how much they're using it, look for the line item Forex on their balance sheet. That's where all this cryptocurrency is put. Um, so kind of think about those CRE and back. I also want to put down there the bottom of this graphic on the Federal Reserve and its balance sheet. So in 2008, the Federal Reserve's balance sheet was just approaching $1 trillion. During the Great Recession and after it, it peaked at a little over four, almost four and a half trillion. So from 2009-10, over the next four years, um, the Fed grew its balance sheet over, um, over three and a half trillion dollars to four and a half trillion. It worked that down to about a year ago um, before 2020 to about three and 3.2, 3.5 trillion dollars. And we're now at over seven and a half trillion dollars. This is unprecedented. And about 10 days ago, I participated in a program at, at Princeton uh, with Chairman, former Chairman Bernanke. And I got the opportunity to ask him, you know, so how do you look at it now being outside in the balance sheet? And he said, look, it, we're never going back below 5 trillion. This is an expansionary monetary policy. 
get ready. We'll see 10 trillion on the balance sheet before we'll ever see it go back to 5 trillion. This has huge implications for us in our industry. It means us as a tangible asset and a hedge on inflation is gonna be very desirable. It also means that our debt costs are probably going up because the Fed can't control the long bond unless it intervenes and uses its balance sheet and starts buying those long bonds to bid the price back down. So understanding what's going on with the Fed's balance sheet. Um, I know a lot of CCMs don't work with multifamily, but we should pay attention to it. One of the things the Fed spent the most money on in its balance sheet was um, on a more, um, mortgage-backed securities and, and CMBS. So uh, a year ago, they didn't even hold $700 billion of mortgage-backed securities. It grew that to over $2 trillion. The reason we didn't have a housing crisis is not because we didn't have inventory and all these other reasons you hear about. Um, it's because the Fed intervened and shored up the housing industry. It bought all the mortgages, the multifamily and the single family and kept rates low and bid them down. So understand how that affects us. Next on convergence on inflation. I want you to really pay attention to this. I put two slides here. This just appeared this week. The US median home price hit 370,000. That's up almost 16% year over year. This is unprecedented. If you go back to World War II, the typical annual rate of inflation in home prices is about two to two and a half percent. So this is back to that 2004, six timeframe and it's unsustainable. The other one is one of my favorite resources we haven't talked about in a while is called ENR, Engineering News Record. And they have a section called Constructionomics. You can subscribe to this for like 120 bucks a year. It's a great piece and it looks at all the construction elements, the total construction costs, the building costs, and then they have a 20 city uh, index that they track. So just for you, Tim, and, and when Barbara was president, I got him to put uh, Birmingham in there, just teasing. Um, but they've got small markets and not just all big markets. <laughs> Um, sorry. Um, and so uh, look at the, on the building cost index and look at these, look at these numbers. Um, you know, you're looking at six, you know, plus percent um, on construction building costs and construction costs way up there. And then look at the city index. So when the Fed says they can't find inflation, um, I send this to them rather regularly. All right, the next one um, on convergence is look at our supply chain. So we talk a lot about this and, um, and, and we have some pieces that I'll share with you in a minute. So this is a great one that Visual Capitalist did with the Suez Canal boat blockage, the ever, the ever um, vessel that blocked the canal. That's now been seized by Egypt to pay the bills <laughs> to open it up. So it was over a billion dollars is what they want. So it's more than the boat and all the stuff on the boat. So they might as well just give them the darn boat. But you look at the Suez Canal and the Panama Canal. These are two of the biggest choke points for all world trade. And so, you know, we tend to think about bridges or our ports or our rail, but there's other global choke points that we need to keep in mind. And you can see, you know, flood and drought aren't something that you think about in terms of the Panama Canal and storms. And what originally uh, precipitated this problem with the Ever Vessel and the Suez Canal was these huge dust storms and all that shifted some of the uh, sand and sediment into the canal that maybe made it not, not so deep for the boat to, to ground itself. But we need to be looking at these global supply choke points. The other one we did a podcast on, CCIM was on top of this for you. And when the American Society of Civil Engineers a couple of three weeks ago released their new quadrennial report on our infrastructure, they do this every four years, the good news was we went from a D grade for 20 something years up to a C, but the only reason was because of the strength in ports and rail. So that's our supply chain. But there's a couple others we need to look at, especially coming out of COVID, aviation, our airports and our airport bonds and, and uh, in infrastructure improvement programs in our airports are in huge um, distress from COVID and they were delayed and the funding isn't there because they didn't have the landing fees and energy. Those of you in Texas and the storms that you had, we put the electric grid back into focus and we're way, way, way behind on those two. So this is a report card I would look at tremendously when I do site selection analysis and work today, we have this new report. This is just as valuable as the, you know, the new 2020 census is gonna be um, that we do every 10 years. So uh, the link is there. You can see where the items are that are stressed. So we pulled out a little bit more here. Um, so we looked at where America's bridges are crumbling. And so guess, guess who wasn't on the, you know, the list, some of the suspects that you want, but look at who was, Missouri and Louisiana. 
bridges in Louisiana. You better believe it from the ports and the riverways that they have to cross Missouri. You forget about the Missouri and the Mississippi River and St. Louis and all the problems and the outdated bridges that have to be updated there. So um, if you think about that, we have on an annual basis, a hundred and on a daily basis, 171 million daily crossings. That's every other American is crossing a bridge during the day on over 45,000 structurally deficient bridges. By structurally deficient, they mean these things shouldn't be open anymore. So when you think about the current infrastructure bill and the plan that they're talking about and how much, how little really goes into these kinds of tangible infrastructure items, we all need to be engaged. And this isn't a, a political debate between right or left, but it's really, if we're gonna put terms like infrastructure bill, let's make sure that we're really dealing with infrastructure. And then look at where we're falling short. Surface transportation, $1.2 trillion. Uh, look at electricity, airports, dams, levees. And so when you look at this current infrastructure bill, you know, you're looking at maybe only 25% dealing with these critical areas. So we have a huge need. And I think as, as an industry and how it affects our real estate, we need to pay attention to it. So two benefits that have been done for you as CCIMs. So the first, um, we did a Ward Center course. Jen Weed, um, I worked uh, with Jen Weed and Beverly uh, Keith, my partner, and we developed the first industry last mile logistics course. So Pat CCIM on the back. No other industry association, not NAR, not ULI, not the Appraisal Institute, you name it, has developed a last mile logistics course. So we put a lot of effort in this, brought a lot of neat insights, provided the definition. So we did that early in the year. That was free to members that renewed. And then the second one that we've got coming, we're really excited about it. We're in the editing phase of a new um, insights paper. So we kind of had to pause during COVID for these insight papers that I had been doing on adaptive reuse and logistics, but we have a new one um, coming out, hopefully in the spring, uh, May, late May, early June uh, on logistics. And we're doing one other thing. We are incorporating a story map into this thing. So you can visualize interactively all these logistics items. So um, again, I'm very grateful to the CCM Institute and you should as well for really keeping an eye on the ball on this important topic. All right. Now let's diverge <laughs> from all of the convergence and talk about what's diverging, pulling apart. Um, so, uh, you know, the four I'm going to cover here are housing, state taxes, retail, um, and then even um, uh, hotels and what's going on with Amazon, Walmart, and Alibaba. So let's start here with, with um, you know, with housing. Um, and this is an interesting item when you look at the number of homes that are selling for over list price. And so NAR just released um, in, the, in, the, um, in, in a study that in California and Colorado, over 60% of the homes that went on the market in the first quarter and in, uh, in, in uh, March here sold for more than their asking price. I live in Atlanta and we always had too many homes and prices never went up. And we have houses now, they put a coming soon sign and there's multiple offers uh, on the same day. We just uh, had a neighbor who put his house on the market with a coming soon sign. And on the first day of the weekend, they had 11 offers. And the last offer was whatever the highest offer is, plus $1,000 and no contingencies. That's how heated up this market is. And that's not typical and it's not sustainable. Oregon and Washington were up there with 56%. And then Massachusetts, many of you have heard me talk about Utah. Uh, Utah is a phenomenal economy, phenomenal, phenomenal population and job growth. You know, over 50% of the homes are selling for more than list price. So the other thing I put a little graphic there to keep in mind how housing is changing. So remember a few years ago, I talked to you about tiny homes and tiny home subdivisions. We now have three of them in, in the uh, central city of Atlanta. And then we started talking last year about four rent subdivisions. You talk about a neat opportunity. For those of you that are newer and younger CCIMs and you need to carve out a niche, I'm telling you the growth in four rent subdivisions across the country is incredible. Well, now Lennar just introduced, one, uh, introduced this new model for uh, empty nesters and retiring baby boomers um, that's uh, an RV, <laughs> an RV um, model home. And you can see the tall garage on the right to park your RV so you can comply with the uh, subdivision uh, covenants. So when, when Tim Blair talks about flu density, you know, where is the, you know, where is the, or influ density, where's the influence and the density of that influence and that wealth and that buying power, look, look for these RV homes and where they're being built, there's real influence density uh, going on there. And I, I bet uh, over near um, the Lake community and down in Baldwin County, Tim, you've got some of these models showing up soon. All right, let's talk about, um, you know, multifamily here for a minute. So we've heard a lot about, you know, 
I've talked about one in four American households can't pay their rent or their mortgage. They're in a rent or mortgage forbearance program. That's staggering. We gotta go back to Great Depression days. Well, it hasn't been a problem because we've extended rent and mortgage forbearance and it goes now all the way into September of this year. So what percentage have actually been paying their rent? So we saw during COVID it dipped below the typical range of 81 to 85%. We're almost back to 80% um, in the latest numbers that, um, uh, that just came out from the National Multi-Housing Council. That's great. But when you still have 20% that can't pay their rent, that's a big number. Um, so you can see the historic norms there. Uh, the other thing I think that you need to pay attention to in multifamily I talk about is look at the divergency. We talk about um, the U-Haul migration trends. Where are people moving? Um, and they're moving out of high cost states and where there's a lack of housing affordability to more affordable. So they're moving out of California and Washington state to places like Boise and Salt Lake and Phoenix and San Antonio and Tim, your backyard, Huntsville and Raleigh and Nashville and Tampas and guess what? Even Columbus, Ohio, it's, it's a hot market. And they're moving out of the California, New York, New Jersey, high tax, high cost, lack of housing affordability states. And I think this is gonna play out in how we see multifamily perform this year and next year. I think we're also gonna see a divergence in uh, urban versus suburban. So with remote work, look at the recent announcement by Salesforce saying, you know, uh, we're the largest employer in San Francisco, 9,000 employees, 54,000 in North America, and they don't need to come into work. They can work almost anywhere they want. We're gonna go to a, a diversified type of campus rather than a centralized campus. And so what does that mean for multifamily and secondary markets in the suburbs? And I think that's a huge, a huge opportunity. All right, the next one is look at state tax climates. So we need to look at it nationally and we need to look at it state by state. So on the right here, you can see where the United States would fall if the current administration succeeds in raising the corporate tax just to 25%. And if it goes to 28%, you know, we start getting up there with Germany and Mexico uh, in a real serious way. We lose our competitiveness. And this means all the benefit we've seen from reshoring and manufacturing come back could be put at risk. On the left there, I put the state uh, business tax climate. So I've talked a little bit in the past about the benefit of the tax foundation as a resource. They track every kind of tax you want by state and visually. And so this is one they do um, on the, um, uh, looking at the latest uh, business tax climate. And so the blue are the most or the best tax climates overall. So it's not just looking at property or income taxes, it's looking at all the taxes, ad valorem on cars and taxes on liquor and you know sales taxes and everything you want. And look at the strength of the, of the mountain, the intermountain Rocky Mountain region with Utah and Wyoming and Nevada and South Dakota in there. And this is partly why Utah is booming. It is a very pro-business tax and climate overall. And it doesn't need a subway system like in New York and all the kinds of infrastructure you have in New York and San Francisco. Look at in the South, look at the strength of North Carolina and Florida. And then the kind of charcoal gray is getting, uh, or the lighter gray is kind of in between. So you see Georgia, Tennessee, uh, Texas all in there. But that charcoal gray is concerning. That means you're among the 10 worst business tax climates. Now, Alabama gets a bad rap, Tim, here because of the um, Rebuild Alabama legislation we passed two years ago. So it was such a dramatic increase, the first one in 25 years. That's what's influencing this. Uh, Alabama is not a high tax state. But um, we need to be paying attention to this because this is how companies are making site selection decisions. And if you're a broker and you're working on a transaction and you're working with institutional capital, this is stuff they're looking at in the decision making of buying assets. All right, divergence. This is a big one. Those that you do retail, I want you to pay attention to. So um, uh, a good friend of mine uh, did this uh, did this recent post, um, uh, Barry Wolf, um, and, and they looked at graphing. Uh, over the last three years, what the percentage of sales were for different categories in e-commerce. So we know during the pandemic, food and beverage, we ordered groceries, we ordered um, you know, Uber delivery to our house. Um, we know that health and personal care, because we couldn't go to the barbershop, we got our own razors and did our own hair coloring. Um, I failed on both, I guess. <laughs> Sporting goods, building materials, like I'm renovating my house. That was a year, the, this past year. My hypothesis is that going forward, we're gonna see people say the house is fixed, 
I want to get out and go eat. I don't want to always order Uber Eats to the house. Um, I don't have to buy sporting goods to play at home with the kids. We can go out and do activities again. So we're going to travel. We're going to go out to eat. We're going to go to places and our consumer dollars are going to shift. And my hypothesis is that you look at this same chart a year from now, you're going to see all those categories that are at the highest this year all fall back down. And it's entertainment, it's dining, it's travel, it's leisure. Those are all what's going to rise. So if you have tenants and you think you're all good with your, your categories in these or, or your retail tenants in these categories, you might be surprised at how they've diverged over the next year. Um, now let's look at lateral shifts. So kind of what's kind of just moving sideways. It's not real destructive. It's not going underground. It doesn't have volatile forces. So I think remote work is one of those at the top. We're, we're not going with less work. We're seeing the rehiring. We had almost a million jobs uh, last month. If we have six to seven more months like that, we'll be back below 4% unemployment and the Fed's got a real problem on its hand. Um, and so what we're seeing is this workforce go somewhere else. If I can work at home, or if I don't have to live in an expensive market like San Francisco or Austin or New York, uh, Boston, Philadelphia, and I can go to Raleigh or I can go to Salt Lake or San Antonio, um, you know, or you know, Birmingham for you, Tim, um, that changes the dynamic in a lot in our economy and how we do work. And major companies, company after company, tech and financial services, the two biggest office users, are saying. We're not, we're not gonna go back to the urban dense high rise model. Um, we might have things where you got, got to get together one or two days a week, but for the most part, we'll figure out a hub or remote work model. So that's gonna be interesting to watch. And we don't know what we don't know yet. And I'm not gonna tell you it's the end of the high rise office building in downtown Marcus, because some like a Birmingham or you know a Colorado Springs or a San Antonio, um, you know even a Phoenix, that may work because you don't have long distances to commute. And, um, and so it still may work out okay. But in big dense markets, I think Chicago, New York, San Francisco, I think this is definitely changing. The next one is looking at the capital flows here. And so this was done by Real Capitalytics. I'm a big fan, a good friend with Jim Costello. He put this one out at the beginning of the year, looking at where the capital came from into the United States last year. And number two was South Korea. And South Korea is a huge investor. They're buying everything. Um, they're putting manufacturing, they're buying industrial, they're buying hotel. Um, they've been one of the bigger buyers of the sale leaseback resorts and the loan portfolios that banks are bundling together. Uh, it's, a, it's a different world. The United Kingdom has had huge out migration. Almost 800,000 workers left London and the United Kingdom last year that are really coming to the United States and other more dynamic economies. So we need to understand there's a lateral shift in where our capital is going and the voids that are created by who used to be there. So they look at Japan, um, you know, even look at where's, where's China on this list. And then think about what's happening with South Korea and, and looking at that. If you don't have connections, if you aren't studying why the capital is moving from South Korea, you're missing a huge opportunity. All right. Also on the lateral shift, I want to talk about a couple here, the CRE credit metrics. So I put both lodging here and appraisal reductions. So you can see the chart here showing the special servicing rate, the kind of the yellow line, the darker gold special servicing balances and the delinquency rate and the blue bars. And what you can see is we've almost peaked out in lodging. And so we were getting up there to one in five loans uh, were delinquent and one in four were in special servicing. And that is petering down. It's particularly petering down because more of the leisure uh, hotel was what went into CMBS because the institutional money, the life companies and whatnot, wanted more of that business and the business convention in the big core cities. And so they can deal with it. They're doing sale leasebacks with Marriott and Hilton and different resorts like a Red Rock. Um, so you can see that's changing, that lateral shift. Who do I think is gonna replace retail and hotel over the next year? It's gonna be office. And it's also gonna be multifamily. Small balance multifamily and large, high luxury, high expensive, uh, multifamily in the big dense urban cities. I don't think everybody's coming back to New York. Uh, every colleague I know that left New York that were diehard New Yorkers and are in, you know, Charleston, South Carolina or West Palm Beach, Florida, um, you know, or, or, or somewhere else, they're not planning on going back. They abandoned their furniture. They couldn't get a rent truck. They'd never had a driver's license in 20 years or a car. They've learned to get a driver's license. They bought a car, they bought a house, 
that doesn't tell me that they're coming back to New York. So I'm, I'm still in the bearish camp. And then look at appraisal reductions. So we were seeing the appraisers really showing the, the pile on. Um, I've been doing some special work for some banks and we've been seeing you know, appraisal assignments that said the hotel was only worth 20 or 30 cents on the dollar. And we're seeing those reductions in flat line and not be as, be as severe. So I think this is some lateral shift in the, in the lodging, the leisure is gonna outperform the return to the business and convention travel. All right, so I'm going to tee up over here to Tim. If you, as you know earthquakes, you kind of have the Richter scale, and you know you get above a five or a six, it's very destructive, especially those that you live in the Western United States. Some of you that are over 100 years old that live in the New Madrid's uh, fault zone that uh, that goes from the Midwest all the way down to Charleston in the Southeast, know it can be equally or more destructive than the San Andreas. It's been idle for about 100 years. And so I've got two questions, uh, Tim, that I think you're going to tee up here that we want to really get your input and really engage you in this dialogue. And um, one last, I always give two last things in the closing. So one is I always try to give you a new metric to look at. So I would encourage you with earnings to look at something called the VIX. Sometimes you hear it on Bloomberg or, you know, um, you know, CNBC. It's the volatility index. And it looks at when the trading that's going on, how volatile is everything? It's a real proxy for what lies ahead. And so you can see during the, you know, November, December timeframe, you know, we got up to a 40 on the VIX. Very, very volatile. It's come way down, settled down into the teens. If you got something 15 or less, it's not bad. It started to tick up a little bit. We need to pay attention to this. If you want to understand the volatility in the stock market, when you might want to start moving some money around, and when this is going to be more bullish for real estate, when capital rotates out of equities into commercial real estate or REITs, watch this VIX. If we see this thing start to go back up to 20 or plus percent, so this is my new one that I would um, that I would encourage you all to look at. So Tim, here's where we are. I'll let you, you take it over and then we'll go back to that slide. If you'd like one, oh, one last thing. So many of you know, I'm no longer with the University of Alabama. Here's our little company. Um, we're an, a majority women owned business. So very proud of that. I do try to walk the ESG walk. Um, here's my team and some of what we do. And I always, Tim, have a good reading recommendation. So my, my new reading recommendation is that Beverly gave me is throwing the elephant. Um, and this is really how you, you know, deal with the elephant in the room, whether it's an HR problem or an issue in your business, how you work through it, how you manage through it. Um, it doesn't have as many pictures as I would like to have in a book like Dr. Seuss, but hey, Tim, I'm evolving. So uh, thank Beverly, but it's all yours, Tim. All right, JC, you covered a lot of ground today. So what are the top three opportunities for CRE pros based on the information? And, and secondly, what skills do folks need to hone or learn to best take advantage of them? So um, what I would say here is I really think we all need to you know, become part economists and understand Fed monetary policy. It affects our interest rates. The interest rates affect the price we can pay for capital, how much leverage, what kind of capital we need. So I think really understanding what's going on in the Fed, those tools I talked about, the AFLL, the IOER, um, and then just understanding what the Fed's done to its balance sheet. The Fed always gets it wrong. I had five years of watching them get it wrong. <laughs> when I was there in 2005 to 10, they didn't understand a construction loan and they couldn't understand their initial forecast for the first stress test was that everything was gonna be fine. And the residential wouldn't spill over into commercial real estate because there was some feature that banks had in their construction loans that allowed the construction loans to stay current. And so I said, what are you talking about? Are you talking about an interest reserve? And they said, that's what it's called. They had no idea what an interest reserve was and how it was masking the performance. Um, Jay Powell's comment on 60 Minutes about cryptocurrency, and it's not going to be a problem for the United States because we like to hold cash. Give me a break. <laughs> um, so I'm very worried about the Fed. I'm, I think that we all need to be prepared that a year from now, we will be at a 3% or higher 10-year treasury. What does that mean for financeability, the value of commercial real estate? So I think those are a couple, but Love to hear from the audience if they, you know, if they've got any thoughts there. What um, uh, CRE skills do you think people need to brush up on to take advantage to be to make sure they're ready? Yeah, so I think a couple of them I mentioned. You know, we just talked about you know the economics. Brush up on your economic skills and that how things are changing. Maybe maybe brush up on uh, plate tectonics to to understand these different types of earthquakes because convergent is very destructive. 
divergent, you know, you, it's it's less destructive. They go in different directions. Lateral is the least destructive. Um, but it, it tells us where the capital is going to go, what type of commercial real estate is going to be, you know, in demand, what's happening with retail, leisure hotel, why it suddenly outperforms business, um, you know, hotel. The other one I'd say is appraisal skills. It is a cluster out there. I do a lot of property tax and litigation expert witness work, and I'm just shocked at how bad the appraisal work is um, and whatnot. And this is an area, CCIM study valuation, um, we all need to brush up on it. Um, you know, I think understand that a cap rate's the inverse of a stock multiple. So when you hear about these stock multiples going up, you know, 15, 20, you know, plus, you know, um, on the multiples for companies, but then they start to pull back, a cap rate's a measurement of risk. And as they rise, it means the risk rise. As they fall, it means the risk goes down. Um, I think highest and best use is another one. We don't understand and teach highest and best use across our commercial real estate industry anymore. And so, you know, I was just in a court case where they're talking about what's legally permissible. And they said, well, it's zoned commercial. So what's the problem? I said, well, there's a cross access easement and an operating agreement for 99 years on the property that precludes redevelopment. And if the big box retailer moves out, you lose all your uh, cross access and parking easements. What's it worth now? And, and the other side said, oh my God, we didn't know that. So this is where we as CCIMs, we take these courses, we take this curriculum. I'd really brush up on the appraisal skills. I think it's one of our biggest deficits and entities are worried about where we are in the cycle and are we paying too much? And they're worried like with the equities, are we paying too much? They wonder, you know, when you see a 4% cap rate on an industrial warehouse, is that too low? So appraisal skills and um, really beefing up on economic skills. All right, I'm gonna do slip in one more and I'm gonna ask you to keep the uh, answer short. Um, <laughs> we're going over. But as you learned in your home renovation, construct, construction material pricing has skyrocketed. Um, what do you foresee as a point where that supply and demand comes into equilibrium or declines? And how does that play out? Yeah, I think it's sometime next year. Steel prices are up over 100%. Appliances, good luck. If you're selling a house today, hold the appliances out. They're worth double. <laughs> um, you know, the way we got our appliances, we went to appliance store and we offered to buy with no discount the on display stuff that we wanted because it was six months to get appliances. Don't have your refrigerator go out. If you're a hunter and you think you need a new freezer, uh, start going online to find them because you can't find it now. Um, the thing that I that I would take away is everything is fine until it's not. And so I think we're in a really inflated period. Home builders are having trouble getting the inventory and the commodities. It's driving prices up. This is why home prices, existing homes are up so much is because of the new home, the materials are up tremendously. So I'll give you one other example on commercial real estate. The REIT that I'm in, uh, we just purchased and closed on Home Depot's newest e-commerce building south of Atlanta on Interstate 75. That same building, we're trying to replicate in another market today and start construction, the bid on the steel is a million dollars more than steel today, and it's a six to nine month delay. The lumber is awful. The con concrete prices are up 25%. So you might want to, if you've got, if you're representing a tenant that's looking at moving, you might not be able to get the sheetrock and or at the price that you want. So what I've learned is uh, everything's kind of chaotic. Um, you got to really stay on top of it. And this is where you can add value to your clients, whether they're a tenant or new construction. All right, All right. sir. Um, thank you so much. And Casey, thank you for sharing your expertise with us here today on this webinar. And thank you to everyone with us today for attending. The recording will be made available on CCIM Institute's YouTube channel by tomorrow. If you're not already a CCIM member or a course participant, take a moment to sign up for our e-newsletter at CCIM.com to stay informed about complimentary webinars like this one, as well as other professional development opportunities. Thanks again, everyone. Have a great day. And let's go do some deals.